Thank you, MediaX, for hosting this conference and for inviting me to speak. It's, uh, spending time with MediaX is one of the favorite things I do on campus, so it's uh, really lovely to be here, and thank you. So today, uh, I have half an hour, and I'm going to do four things. First, I'm going to talk about my new book and the kind of argument that is gelling as I write the book, which is due in five weeks. So uh, we're going to talk about the theme of the book. Second, I'm going to talk about a narrative journey that I've taken for the last three years producing a piece of media uh, about using VR to teach ocean acidification and the things I've learned along the way. Third, I'm going to report to you on a conversation that I had this morning. So this morning I spent two hours with a gentleman named Brett Leonard. Anybody recognize that name, Brett Leonard? He directed a very famous movie called Lawnmower Man, very relevant to virtual reality, and it turns out he's now got a company called Virtuosity uh, that's doing storytelling in VR. So uh, he's an amazing guy, and I'm going to just report very uh, in an ad hoc manner on the conversation we had a couple hours ago. Finally, uh, I'm going to do all that in 15 minutes. I really want to have 15 minutes for questions and answers. So please, I hope you guys have some things to ask, because I'm going to try to move quickly and really keep this interactive so that we can have a conversation. All right? OK, so the book is called Experience on Demand. Of course, the publisher will change the title uh, like they tend to do. But the general idea is that we should think of virtual reality not as a media experience, but more like an actual experience. How many of you guys have been in virtual reality before? Hands in the air, yeah? So I'm going to save time by not taking you through this notion of presence and, and how we build VR. But for those of you who have been there, you realize that virtual reality is a medium very different than other media. It's more like an actual experience. And I can talk about the studies from my lab, but about 20 years of research has shown that the brain tends to treat VR closer to an actual experience than, say, watching TV or using a computer. So that being said, what should we do in VR? And there's really three downsides of VR, as I can see it, uh, as I do my thinking writing this book. The first is distraction. When you're in VR, the reason why it's so compelling is that you're present in the virtual world, absent from the physical world. So for this reason, you're going to step on the cat, you're going to get mugged on subways, you're going to walk into walls. The distraction safety element is something I think about a lot in VR. It's a downside. VR, by definition, replaces senses from the physical world with virtual ones. You're not present. The second is addiction. We know many of you in this room are addicted to your devices. I know I am. Uh, I'm always thinking about my device. I'm checking my email four times a minute. And that's just text. When social networking feels like the best party you've ever been to, when pornography feels like sex, when gambling feels like Las Vegas, how is the world going to function? And that's something that does keep me up at night. The third downside is it's just uncomfortable. Even the best amazing helmets that you can buy now for a couple hundred bucks that have had billions poured into it, they're great for about 20 minutes. They're not great for a couple hours. So VR is not free. There are constraints on VR. Distraction, addiction, and discomfort. That being said, what should we do in VR? And the guidelines that I'm working on, uh, four, there's some combination of four checklists Four checks you should make be, and when you're deciding, is it worth using VR for this experience? The first one is for danger. So where does VR come from? We have these things called flight simulators. Why do we have flight simulators? Because lives are expensive, planes are expensive. Let's learn how to make mistakes when there's no cost to making mistakes. So if it's a dangerous thing to do in the physical world, let's do it in VR. The second is expensive and rare. So why would you not fly to the top of Kilimanjaro? Well, maybe it's expensive to do that, and it's really a hard and rare experience. So that passes the bar of something that's worth doing in VR, because it's an expensive and difficult thing to do. The third is impossible. So I won't go into depth, but we've got a line of research where we're teaching people how to overcome racial bias, gender bias, discrimination against many different groups by literally becoming someone else. They look down and, whoa, I'm a woman. Well, I'm a person of color and I walk around and experience trauma firsthand. I experience prejudice firsthand by literally wearing the body of someone else. Impossible to do in the physical world, therefore a good candidate in VR. The fourth bucket is counterproductive. And the best example for this, not that I've done this in the lab, uh, if you think about the old uh, adage of when the father catches the teenage son smoking cigarettes, he locks him in the closet with a carton of cigarettes, makes him smoke them all and come out. 
you learn a really valuable lesson that smoking is kind of gross and you shouldn't do it, but at what cost to your lungs? VR, you can get these kind of lessons without actually hurting yourself. So things that would be counterproductive to do in the physical world, but still have good value, also fit into that th narrative of things you should be, in, be doing in VR. So to sum up, VR is not free, kind of hurts your eyes, takes you out of the physical world, you're gonna bump into walls, and it's possibly addictive and is gonna change the way we think about society. So therefore, we shouldn't be watching TV in it, we shouldn't be watching two hour long NBA games in it, we shouldn't be spending six hours a day playing video games in it, we should reserve it, in my humble opinion, for these special type of experience. Okay, one of these experiences is a project that Dr. P, myself, and a marine scientist named Theo McKelly have been working on for three years. I'll raise your hands if you know what ocean acidification is. Okay, 15 of you out of the 70 here. That's actually a little higher than normal, so I'm gonna teach you one useful thing today, and that's what ocean acidification is. So when humans produce carbon dioxide, 30% approximately of that CO2 gets absorbed by the ocean. When this occurs, some, the pH level of the water goes down, the water becomes more acidic, and the same way that when you add carbon dioxide to seltzer, it becomes more corrosive. When you add carbon dioxide to water, it becomes like seltzer, it becomes more corrosive. This is going to destroy life as we know it. How do we know? Because our colleague, Fiona Kelly, has discovered this reef off the island of Ischia, which is off the coast of Naples, that has volcanic vents that spew pure carbon dioxide. This is very rare. Typically, when there's a volcanic vent, it spews sulfur and methane and other corrosive materials. These spew pure carbon dioxide. So what this reef is, it's a crystal ball that shows how all of the world's oceans are gonna look by, by the year 2100. Remember, all of our CO2 gets absorbed by the ocean, 30% of it. All the oceans are slowly becoming more acidic. We know it's gonna be a disaster because Theo and her colleagues study this particular reef that shows the future because it's got naturally occurring volcanic vents. So we began three years ago to build a field trip in virtual reality that takes you to Ischia. I can't take all of you physically to Ischia. If I did, that would be really bad. If I'm trying to solve climate change and I flew you all the way to Ischia, that'd be a bad way to do it. That's the counterproductive element. It would also be dangerous because you're not all scuba certified. So if I were to force you to go scuba diving and look at these vents, you could get hurt. It's obviously expensive, uh, et cetera. So we have spent the last three years of our lives, a very generous grant from the Gordon Betty Moore Foundation, as well as from the Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment, iterating this field trip. And I'm gonna take you through a couple of the iterations. Uh, there's been many, uh, and then tell you where it is today. So uh, we started out, we sent Cody Kruitz, my graduate student, uh, to Ischia, and we crafted together this underwater rig where you can take spherical video underwater. This was in 2013, 14, uh, probably a lot easier to do now. It was a very difficult endeavor there. And Cody uh, braved some elements and went down and captured this evidence that climate change is going to destroy our oceans, got this amazing spherical video from zones that were highly acidified and from healthy zones and medium points along the way. So basically you can think of the distance from these vents the farther you go in space is actually a journey in time. If you go very far away, you're in the present of our oceans. The closer you get to these vents, the closer you are to the year 2100. And when you get to the vents, there's no coral, it's all died. There's no fish because the fish eat the coral. Algae's taken over. You can see the transformation that none of your grandchildren are going to be able to eat fish when they are uh, kids because there's not going to be any fish left in the ocean. So Theo's published all of this research in science and nature, all the great journals. Dr. Jane Lubchenco, the head of the NOAA uh, under President Obama, called it global warming's evil twin. But in this room of brilliant people, you came here to learn only 15 of you have heard of ocean acidification. So we built this field trip. We did it. Uh, collaboratively, it started with the spherical video, we then brought the spherical video back, and for those of you that have never tried, spherical video is basically a video you can look around and you can't interact with anything, you just get to watch a video and it tracks your head so you can look around the sphere. It's uh, an example of that is what the New York Times sent out uh, with uh, Google Cardboard. So we started with that, but then we wanted to make it interactive. Roy and I really work on a theory called embodied cognition, which is people learn by doing. Uh, your body retains muscle memory for action. By actually having people do tasks, they learn better. So what we did is we let, began a huge endeavor where we had a computer graphics company build a 3D model of these zones. So every single snail, every single blade of seagrass, we had to model and put in the right way. 
why this was brutal is because a software company came back and they kept giving me find, Finding Nemo, beautiful scene with all these fish. The marine scientist said, turns out the Mediterranean, even when it's healthy, doesn't look like that, and you've got to get rid of all those beautiful fish, and that process lasted forever. The first time we took it out in public, this now we're talking about this interactive one that we spent all this time on, we went to the Tribeca Film Festival. It was a, an official selection for the festival. It was a seven minute journey where we had narrative and you actually learned organically what ocean acidification is and, uh, and how it's gonna affect the oceans. And um, uh, Jane Rosenthal, the brilliant woman who runs uh, the Tribeca Film Festival, built an arcade. There were 17 full body tracking sections uh, where they used the HTC Vive, and we had two of those where we had thousands of people, no exaggeration, thousands of people come through over a one-week period. So we had from 11 a.m. till 10 p.m. every day for six days in a row. We had a line of 100 people waiting to learn about marine science. Um, but in my opinion, uh, it was a wonderful success because we just got it out there and got it done and it mostly worked, but we failed from a narrative standpoint in a number of ways, and I'll give you a couple examples of that. The first is, you know that you failed in VR when some people just look straight ahead the whole time. In other words, what makes VR special is you get to turn your head and walk around, and the way that we built it, some people just stood there the whole time. So failure on that part. What makes VR great is freedom. So uh, Hollywood, they tell stories, and they're brilliant at it. In VR, what makes it special is you get to do whatever you want. It's the complete definition of democracy in media. What makes it special is that it's a model that works from any angle and every distance, and you can pick up any object and physics enabled, and you throw it here. And the so we didn't constrain the possible actions here, and what we had is we, had, we built these amazing reefs that showed the science, and then some people, just chose to swim and swim and swim and get a thousand meters away from anything that uh, showed the science. So the beauty of VR is that it allows you to do whatever you want whenever you want, but this is the storyteller's enemy. And so uh, we can talk a lot about this in the question and answer, but threading that needle, which is allowing VR to be VR and to give people this freedom to explore while telling them a story is really, really hard. Another lesson we learned along the way was you can't make it too physically engaging. So our first iteration, we, uh, we wanted people to really get a sense of this metaphor of distance and time, that the farther away you get, the, the, far, the closer in the future you're getting. So we enabled them to swim. We had full body tracking and they were swimming. Some people can't swim. They get tired, they've got a hurt shoulder. And we had a subset of people that couldn't do the experience because we tried to get too fancy uh, on our input devices. Probably the biggest problem, and that we still haven't solved, is we're telling a very complicated story. So we, we are now on iteration 20 of this. At it, by iteration 14, about half the people that would go through still believed that volcanic vents were the cause of ocean acidification. Meaning the story, the narrative is really complicated if you don't know the science. It's this special reef has natural vents that are volcanic, that simply show what the future of all the oceans is because all the ocean absorb the CO2 that humans produce. It's a really complicated story and we had a hard time getting it right. One of the reasons why it was so hard is because VR is so cool, when it's done well, you don't listen. So in our later iterations, what we were doing was literally stopping the action and forcing words down their ears, okay? Which is, you know, uh, we had to make a decision. In version 17 or 18, uh, we, it was still a very highly gamified experience, meaning there was a score and you're doing all these fun things and there's all these different counts, and, but nobody was listening to the science. So what we did is on this final version, uh, we skewed it really far on the education side and then gave them fun stuff to do, but these are kind of free time experiences. Now, uh, five weeks ago, we brought this to the floor of the US Senate. So uh, my brilliant staff and students, we all flew to DC. We got all of our equipment through security somehow. Uh, we set it up at the Senate, it worked. Uh, and we had two sessions, one for the members and one for the staffers. And um, the lesson here is that we had to have a separate session for the members. Anyone who's done VR knows you look really silly doing it, okay? VR is fun because you're, you're running around and you're grabbing stuff and senators don't want to be seen by their staffers, by media, you know, rolling around on the floor. So this is another challenge for the narrative, which is that, you know, important people, when they're in public, don't want to look silly. So 
I don't know how to solve these challenges, but I thought I'd give you an update. The neat thing, uh, how many of you guys have an HTC Vive in this room? Anyone? Okay. Please go to Steam, download the Stanford Ocean Acidification Experience. Try it. It's free for everybody. We made it free for everyone. We uploaded it to Steam. And if you like it, give it a good review, please. Because we are trying to get more than 15 people in a room to know what ocean acidification is. Okay. Finally, I'm going to report on my conversation this morning. So, uh, Lawnmower Man, arguably one of the more influential pieces of, uh, of science fiction that affects a lot of scientists. And um, had a really fun conversation with this guy, Brett Leonard. He's uh, really had thought a lot about this, and he's really pushing storytelling in a new direction. So I'm just going to quickly coin or repeat two words and two phrases and uh, giving full credit to Brett. These are his, not mine, and I like them a lot. I think I'm going to use them more often. Oh, you should also know in my new book, there's 10 chapters, and there's only one I haven't started, and it's a chapter on VR narrative storytelling. So uh, this talk comes at a really good time, which I'm excited about. All right, so his first term is story worlding. Story worlding. He doesn't think stories should be told in VR. He says that you should build worlds and let them do stuff and experience it. So I just wanted to share that word with you. I like that, story worlding. You're not telling. VR is not about telling people stuff. We have to abandon that model in VR. The second, and I really like this, uh, he says when he wants to build VR for storytelling that allows this, this, these experiences that are organic and bottom up, you have to have what's called narrative magnets. Narrative magnets, which is little shiny things that make you engage into some kind of narrative that's going on inside of the experience so that you go there. And so how many guys, you guys got watch Westworld? Anybody watch Westworld? So uh, if you like this topic and you haven't watched Westworld, you should. Westworld is uh, probably the best example of what Brett was talking about, which is there's these robots slash avatars, whatever you want to call them. They're always on autopilot, and they have just enough uh, degrees of freedom where they can change and bring you in, but they're designed to bring you into a narrative and you go experience it. And uh, Brett, who's probably thought more about this than most people have, uh, I think he's really onto something. Mm -hmm.